Uh, a quick word of introduction. I think this, this event is so personal for all of us and for me too. I worked for Richard Holbrook at the US mission to the United Nations. It was a serendipitous connection. Uh, I read about him and admired him and kind of wrote a cold letter. And I imagined there'd be you know, a list of hundreds of young people clamoring to get that job. And somehow, some way, I got a phone call. And it was at the time when he needed to settle the US arrears to the United Nations and was looking, somehow thought, because I was working at McKinsey at the time, that I knew something about spreadsheets, uh, which I really didn't, but I, I went in for the interview with him, and I was actually kept waiting for about four hours on his chief of staff's couch before going in for a stand-up interview. He's about to go out and meet you, Kati, so he made clear he didn't have much time, but he asked me what I understood the job to be, and I guess my answer passed muster, and it was off to the races for just a great adventure, uh, a short stint together, about 18 months, but as George describes in the book, he was uh, hell-bent on securing this deal with the 189 member states of the United Nations to lower the U.S.'s dues to the world body and in, in so doing be able to pay back the arrears that we owed. And someone once at the time said to me, Richard Holbrook was the only person who could enter a revolving door behind you and exit it in front of you. And I experienced this personally on the last night of our negotiation. We'd been working on this for just about 18 months. We had to get the agreement of the entire UN system. It was the General Assembly, so anybody uh, in practice could block it. And on the last night, we were kind of almost there, but there were a lot of details to be ironed out. And virtually every single ambassador in the UN system pulled a full all-nighter on a Friday night. It was December 22nd, and the UN was about to close for the year, so we had to get this done. And we had the most distinguished ambassadors from France and the UK who became kind of household names, and they were all there in it. Richard was home. It was Christmas Eve Eve, and he was just, he knew he had this deal in the bag. He had laid the groundwork, he had made the rounds, he had cajoled, he had entertained, he had lined things up, and he was locked and loaded. And yet we were still encountering glitches. Madeleine Albright had to call the Korean foreign minister at about five in the morning, and we were pacing and, and wringing our arms to see whether this was going to come together. And then someone came in with the New York Times. And I, I made a, 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 I printed this out, and the headline, the front page was, after long fright, UN agrees to cut dues paid by US. So Richard had planted the headline and gotten the paper printed before the deal was done. And uh, it barely acknowledges that there were one or two details still to be ironed out. So uh, that, that, that was his modus operandi. And I think George has just done such an extraordinary job in capturing the nuance and the complexity and the dimensions of this exceptional man. So he's going to start by reading a little bit, and then we'll have a conversation, and then we'll open it up to all of you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to uh, Asia Society and to Penn. I've been a member of Penn for about 25 years, and I'm um, a great admirer of it and of Suzanne's because it's one of the very few organizations that truly believes in freedom of expression, not for this expression or that expression, but freedom of expression, which is uh, under pressure from every direction these days. And today was a good day for freedom of expression. So I'm going to read uh, from near the end of the book because we're here at Asia Society and what I'll be reading from has to do with Asia. <clears throat> Richard Holbrook's last job was as a special representative uh, for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And in a strange way, this last uh, go round called him back to his very first job in the Mekong Delta as a young Foreign Service officer. Um, this scene I'm going to read takes place very early in the Obama administration, really only three weeks or so after the inauguration. On February 13, Holbrook was in Kabul on his first trip to the region since his appointment. In the Situation Room, the President and his advisors were meeting to make a final decision on the troops. Hillary Clinton was giving a speech at Asia Society and had asked Holbrook to fill in for her. He sat in a darkened room in the U.S. Embassy, 
connected by secure video teleconference to the White House. It was past midnight in Kabul, and Holbrook was tired. When Obama called on him, he began to read from notes he'd written down in a lined copybook. Let me speak on Secretary Clinton's behalf and at her direct instructions in support of option two. This was the option to send 17,000 combat troops in one deployment rather than splitting them up into two tranches. We do so with reluctance and mindful of the difficulties entailed in any troop deployment. This is a difficult decision, especially at a time when Afghanistan faces a political and constitutional crisis over its own elections that further complicates your decision. As your first decision to send troops overseas and into combat, as opposed to Iraq, this decision lies at the savage intersection of policy, politics, and history. Who talks like this, Obama murmured. <laughs> he sounded genuinely puzzled. Everyone around the Situation Room table heard him, but Holbrook, 7,000 miles away, didn't hear and kept going. It is in many ways strange to send more American troops into such a potentially chaotic political situation. If we send more troops, of course we deepen our commitment with no guarantee of success. And the shadow of Vietnam hovers over us. Obama interrupted him. Richard, what are you doing? Are you reading something? Holbrook on screen explained that the secretary had wanted to be sure the president heard her views accurately. He continued, but if we do not send more troops, the chances of both political chaos and Taliban success increase. Why are you reading, Obama insisted. Holbrook stopped to explain again. He managed to get through the rest of his notes, which could have been summed up in a couple of lines, but he had lost the president. He didn't understand what he'd done wrong, only that Obama sounded annoyed and ignored him for the rest of the meeting. It was the worst encounter he'd had with the president since Jimmy Carter chewed him out in South Korea in 1979 over troop withdrawals. He regretted reading his notes aloud. He'd done so in order not to ramble on, but it had sounded like a speech or a first draft of his memoirs. A few younger people seated back against the walls found it exciting to hear this old lion talk about savage intersections. But no one around the table wanted to be addressed like that. And when Obama expressed irritation, they could only conclude that Holbrook was already out of favor with the new president, which meant that nobody had to worry about it. After the meeting, Obama told Jones that he would tolerate Holbrook in the Situation Room only if he kept his remarks short and that he wanted to be in Holbrook's presence as little as possible. Skipping a couple of pages here. I can't help thinking the heart of the matter was Vietnam. Holbrook brought it up all the time. He couldn't resist. He passed around copies of a book he'd recently reviewed, Lessons in Disaster, about McGeorge Bundy and the fatally flawed decisions that led to escalation. He invoked the critical months of 1965 so portentously that Obama once asked him, is that the way people used to talk in the Johnson administration? It wasn't that Holbrook was becoming a Vietnam boar, a sodden old vet staggering out of the triple canopy jungle to grab strangers by the shirt front and make them listen to his harrowing tale. Obama actually didn't want to hear about Vietnam. He told his young aides that it was that it wasn't relevant, and they agreed. Vietnam was ancient history. Obama was three when Clark Clifford warned Johnson not to send ground troops. Dennis McDonough and Ben Rhodes were years from being born. You could understand the response. What was Obama supposed to do with the analogy? It didn't tell him how many more troops could make a difference in Helmand province. It told him that his presidency might be destroyed by this war. It was the note of doom in the Situation Room. It turned Holbrook into a lecturer, condescending to the less experienced man, and that was as intolerable to Obama as flattery. He liked young, smart, ultra-loyal staffers. He didn't like big, competitive personalities. 
The divide between them began with temperament, widened with generation, and ended in outlook. Obama, half Kenyan, raised in Indonesia, Pakistani friends in college, saw himself as the first president who understood the United States from the outside in. He grasped the limits to American power and knew that not every problem had an American solution. The Bush administration and Clinton's before it had fallen prey to the hubris of a lone superpower. Then came the Iraq war and the economic collapse and a reckoning required us to sober up. Obama wouldn't say so, but his task was to manage our decline, which meant using power wisely. He embodied his long slender fingers pressed skeptically against his cheek as he listened from the head of the table in the situation room, the very opposite of the baggy grandiosity that thought we could do anything and the craven fear of being called weak for not trying. My guess is Obama wasn't thinking of the Berlin airlift or the Dayton peace accords, only of the impulses that sank America in Vietnam and Iraq. The president and his aides believed these were Holbrook's impulses too, when in fact he was only saying, be careful, it could happen to you. Ob Obama didn't want to hear it, couldn't hear it because the speaker kept distracting him with theatrics and bombast worthy of LBJ himself. So Obama told Jim Jones and Jones told Clinton and Clinton told Holbrook, stop it with Vietnam. They don't think they have anything to learn from Vietnam, she said. They're going to make the same mistakes, he said. Holbrook confessed to Les Gelb that even Hillary wasn't interested. He tried to stop, but it was impossible. How could he not be haunted? There was nothing new under the sun. Somehow, after a half-century excursion across the heights of American greatness, we had returned to the exact same place. All the questions in Afghanistan had been the questions in Vietnam. Could we transform their society? If not, could we still win the war? Did our very effort make it less likely? What leverage did we have? Should we get rid of their leader? Could we talk our way out? And this is from Holbrook's diary. It is beyond ironic that 40 plus years later, we are back in Vietnam. Of course, everything is different and everything is the same. And somehow I am back in the middle of it. The only senior official who really lived it. I had not thought much about Vietnam for years. Now it comes back every day. Every program has its prior incarnation mostly unsuccessful, yet the 9-11 difference is also there. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese pose no threat to the US. Bob Gates will be in the same spot as McNamara. Biden will play George Ball. And I, well, I think we must recognize that military success is not possible and we must seek a negotiation. But with who? The Taliban are not Hanoi and their alliance with Al-Qaeda is a deal breaker. Now this is back away from the diary. Here was the paradox. He knew from Vietnam that what we were doing in Afghanistan wouldn't work, but he thought he could do it anyway. He was speaking with Frank Wisner regularly and Gelb daily, sometimes several times a day, and they heard him out, expressed their doubts, and encouraged him to press on. They drove him deeper into the paradox because knowing both Vietnam and Holbrook, they thought the same thing. It was impossible, but he might succeed, because if not Holbrook, who? And there was something else. If he applied the real lesson of Vietnam, don't. He would be out of a job, and then who would he be? Thank you. It was great. Thank you, George. Um, very kind of transporting to hear you read that way. So I'm going to start with the paradox because uh, that's where you started. He came out of Vietnam with a bracing, clear-eyed view of the war and everything that had gone wrong and the fundamental impossibility of the task that the U.S. had set out for itself 
but also emerged with a lifelong faith in the redemptive capacity of American power. Like those were two conclusions that cohabited in his head. How do you make sense of that? What do you think was the lesson that he drew? What was the lesson that he was trying to bring back to those conversations in the sit room so many years later? Well, a lot of diplomats of his generation who cut their teeth in Vietnam um, came to the conclusion that American force is, is dangerous and that it will almost inevitably drag us into unwinnable wars and that we should only use it, Colin Powell's version, with overwhelming force and an exit strategy, Anthony Lake's version with great restraint, in fact, rarely, if ever. Um, Richard Holbrook took a different lesson. He was not just shaped by Vietnam. He was shaped by the generation that got us into Vietnam and by the generation before them who created the post-war order, the United Nations, NATO, uh, who uh, gave Germans the Berlin airlift, who fought the Cold War, who carried out the doctrine of containment. Those were his heroes, Marshall, Kennan, Acheson, Harriman. And if he modeled himself on anyone, it was those men. And even Vietnam, even a trauma as deep and long as Vietnam did not shake him out of the conviction that that vision, a world in which American leadership was both necessary and for the most part good, um, should continue. He, he, he didn't lose that faith or that, that vision, <clears throat> call it liberal internationalism, that's sort of the technical term for it. So after Vietnam, he had been deeply um, disturbed. He was an early eyewitness and analyst of the war. He saw before almost any of the cohort who were over there in the early 60s that it was not going well, that we were not winning. He only thought it was unwinnable a few years later, because it takes a long time to get to that point. But I think he came away thinking, first of all, be careful, be skeptical, don't listen to the generals and accept everything they tell you. He had seen the militarization of our policy in Vietnam up close and was, for the rest of his life, a, a critic of the militarization of foreign policy. But he did not lose his basic belief that America had to lead. Just he became, I think, a once burned skeptic of people who claimed that force was always the right way. But he didn't look back that much. Unlike some of his friends and colleagues, he was always looking ahead. And so Vietnam didn't haunt him. It didn't, um, it didn't cripple him. But I would say at the end of his life, when he suddenly found himself responsible for the civilian side of a war that looked a hell of a lot like Vietnam, he began to be haunted by it again. So you say, uh, you, you sort of ask your reader, do you mind if we hurry through the early years? Uh, and we'll get to uh, sort of George's dialogue with the reader, which is just a feature of how he's presented this book. And I found myself wondering, if we miss something by hurrying through the early years. Because, you know, a few things. I mean, first of all, the point you just made about these enduring influences of the post-war heroes and containment and, you know, and obviously there's a relationship with Atchison, but, you know, with, how... With how, Russ, uh, Sorry, with Russ. Yeah. How these other influences uh, loom for him as a very young man, because he goes to Vietnam in his early 20s. Mm -hmm. So... Whenever, you know, these, these other influences were instilled presumably before that or maybe congruent with that. And, you know, there's two things, two qualities of his that you draw out so vividly. The kind of striving, yearning, overpowering sense of agency that he has that mm -hmm. all of us, you know, you can't sort of tell a story with, about him without uh, it, it, it bringing out this quality of his, his sense of confidence that his own will and energy can make things happen, whether it's uh, cash assistance or a, a huge deal at the United Nations or uh, a peace treaty. And then, you know, on the flip side, the, the, the ego, the glaring insecurities, mm 
that you, you know, vividly, so vividly and, and kind of poignantly draw. It all seems ripe for psychoanalytic interpretation. Yeah. You resisted that temptation yeah. scrupulously. Like, tell me, tell me why. I just thought it was a dead end because, first of all, you would need, you would need the evidence. You would need not just speculation and psycho babble from a great distance, uh, which I'm a little allergic to in biography and in writing in general. I think speculating about the true origin of people's motives is a bit of, of a fool's game because it's too complicated for that. There is no single Freudian original trauma that explains everything about our lives, or certainly not about Richard Holbrook's life. There wasn't much evidence. He didn't talk about his parents ever. I mean, almost never. He erased his past in order to be the man that he wanted to be. And friends and others have almost no recollection of his ever talking about his family or his childhood. Um, his parents are gone. Um, people who knew him when he was young all sort of tell the same story. He was a very bright, ambitious, and somewhat um, irreverent and even rebellious young guy. I think it's move on. My, my feeling is you get to know Richard Holbrook by seeing what he does, not by imagining you can delve deep into the depths of his psyche, because I, I don't think that, the, that he left behind a trail of psychological information other than his actions and the words in his diaries, which I've quoted at great length, and the reader can then come to conclusions based on those. So there's some mysteries. I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, what was the key event of his childhood, it was the death of his father yeah. when he was uh, 16 years old, or 15, actually, um, which had to have been devastating. But how do I know it was devastating? He never said it was devastating. He never acted as if it was devastating. He immediately sort of moved away from his own family to the Rusks because his neighbors and friends in Scarsdale, New York in the late 50s were the Rusk, Dean Rusk and his family, and Holbrook's best friend in high school was Rusk's son, and that was his connection to the world of diplomacy. And he sort of found a very reluctant and not particularly um, successful surrogate father in Dean Rusk. A couple of times late in life, and it was always around the UN period, once when Bill Clinton announced his yeah, appointment the, yes. in the Rose Garden, yeah, and another time when, during his hearings in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with Jesse Helms, his voice broke when he mentioned his father. And he just said, I don't do this in public much, and I, I'm not going to keep talking. Yeah. You can imagine a whole world of feelings, but um, I think it takes us away from the vividness of action and of the man to start spinning theories in the air. It didn't seem profitable to me. So I want to ask about your choice to write the book in the second person. And you maintain this kind of running dialogue with the reader where you say things about his time at the UN. I don't know what good way to tell you about those months. There was no single theme, but nonstop blur, a purposeful activity. And I'm afraid of leaving you with a highlight film. And then poignantly at the end, you say, but now that Holbrook is gone and we're getting to know the alternatives, don't you too feel some regret? History's cruel that way. He loved it all the same. I'm interested in your decision to right. insert yourself in that way, and it's, it's episodic. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. occasional. It would be cloying and overbearing to do it throughout. So it's there at the beginning. It's there at key moments throughout, especially when I want to change the pace and cover a lot of ground quickly. The, the basic idea for it came to me literally as I was driving on Interstate 84 in Connecticut and trying to, I was thinking about this book that I was going to write. I hadn't written a word of it and didn't know what the first word would be. And I heard a voice in my head say, Holbrook, yes, I knew him. And I wondered who that was talking and why I had heard it. And this doesn't happen to me often. I'm not a mystical writer by any means. But this felt a little like a mystical experience. And I, I knew it instinctively I should pay attention to that. I should follow that. 
because it excited me. It sounded good. It sounded like it had energy and, and personality. And I knew it wasn't quite me. It was somehow some composite of all the people older than me who I'd interviewed who knew him. And it, I, I immediately felt comfortable in the presence of that voice. It gave me a kind of right to tell this story. Because a biographer is constantly struggling with the idea of why do I get to do this? Why, you know, what do I know and what right do I have? And I also knew I did not want to write a conventional biography. I thought, who's going to read a dry, aloof, dull book about a mid-level diplomat who happened to be the most interesting man I've ever known, nonetheless, a mid-level diplomat whose yeah. reputation is fading. And by the time I finally got the book done, it had faded for in the years since his death. What I wanted to write was a novel, a novelistic biography. In fact, Les Gelb kind of gave me a clue to that in a piece he wrote after Holbrook's death when he said, far better to write a novel about Richard C. Holbrook than a biography, let alone an obituary. And what I think he meant was, this is a big man. This is, I hate to use it, a Shakespearean figure. And the thin, neutral, reedy voice of a conventional biographer would just be destroyed in the presence of that subject, would not do it justice. I had the idea that this should be more like a yarn. It's as if the reader is listening to a tale over a long night told by someone who somehow just knows the whole story. There's no evidence of my research in the book. There are no interviews in the book. There are no notations of documents in the book. It's told as a story. And I think that was the way both to capture the scale and size of Richard Holbrook and also to put him in the context of an era and really to make him the embodiment of, of that era. You, you kind of evoke the Shakespearean. Do you see this as a tragedy? It's a tragic comedy because he is fun. He is alive. I wanted there to be energy crackling off every page because only that could capture his energy. There's something a bit manic, something um, overwhelming about him. And there is also some tragedy in it, I think. And the scene that I read at the beginning captures a bit of the uh, almost the faded collision of these two men, Barack Obama and Richard Holbrook, at the end of his life and his career that, that was a, a, a sad uh, and ill-fated uh, meeting. So it's not, it, it's not a sad story, but it's not um, pure celebration either. It's the man in full, at least I hope so. I tried. I don't know. I, I know I couldn't have captured him in full, but what I wanted was Richard Holbrook in the round. So speaking of capturing him in full, you deal with his personal life in some depth. And you know, I, I guess that's a question for any biographer. And if you think of so many sort of great man biographies and presidential biographies, whether it's, it's Kennedy or LBJ or FDR, you know, eventually in the fullness of time, you know, those stories about them and their women and how they treated women uh, and infidelities have come out, but kind of more in secondary works, not in maybe the primary or the first biographies. Now, he's not someone who's going to have probably a string of biographers, and, and yours is an unconventional form of storytelling. But I'm wondering how you thought, and there, yeah, there's some details, obviously, it's clear you, you, you know, but you've left out. Uh, and then, you know, there's some stories that are told, uh, you know, his, the affair he has with, with Tony Lake, the wife of his best friend. Uh, is you know, not, we don't uh, get the account in detail, but we know that it happened. How did you think about the role yeah. of those dimensions of his character as part of this story? Did you, you feel like the reader needed to know this, and, and in what ways? Yeah, I wanted never for it to be gratuitous. Um, the one you mentioned in particular was extremely consequential because it 
ruptured his closest friendship and turned these two colleagues into enemies, and that had consequences for decades, for public policy even, as well as for their relationship. Um, I don't think you can separate the personal life from the professional and public life. The same drive, the same uh, attachments, insecurities, appetites, the same almost demon energy that um, made him an indefatigable negotiator at the UN and in the Balkans, um, made him someone who needed to eat everything on the table and to see every movie that was playing in New York and to uh, travel to every country at the ends of the earth and to know many women. And um, his, the women especially are important because he's more himself with women than with men. Men are always a little bit competitors and it's at times very much so, and some of them get mowed down if they're seen as real competitors, but even those who are either his disciples or his bosses, it's a tense relationship with many of them. Whereas with women, at least with a few women, I should say with a very few women, he showed himself, I think, in his vulnerability, in his fragility, uh, even his neediness. And um, so we see something deeper in him um, in, the, in those personal relationships than we ever get in the Situation Room or um, at Dayton. I want to come back to you know, your, your description of his confluence uh, with Obama as sort of part of the tragedy that these two men did not connect and you had yeah. different personalities, oeuvres, worldviews. And I'm curious, you know, do you think Holbrook, that it was a function of the times that really, when you talk about Obama's job, saw his job as managing decline and Holbrook was not somebody who viewed American power in that way. You know, to you, is that, is that a matter of Obama's worldview, or is that a matter of kind of the reality that he and all of us find ourselves in, you know, in this sort of uh, first quarter of the 21st century? I mean, I think it's primarily generational. Obama was self-consciously putting himself in opposition to the foreign policy establishment from the beginning of his campaign to the last day of his presidency. All you have to do is read my Atlantic boss, Jeff Goldberg's great essay, The Obama Doctrine, to know that in some ways, Obama's main <laughs> adversary on foreign policy was the establishment. And Holbrook to Obama was very much a part of that. So there was deep skepticism about Holbrook all through the inner circle, partly because of the roughness of the campaign in 2008, and partly because of what they thought they knew about Holbrook and about his generation. So I think there was a conscious uh, effort to scale back our ambitions, our commitments, our sense that we could solve these problems. Holbrook was skeptical too, and this is one of the, maybe the missed opportunities that made it rather tragic. Holbrook wasn't cheering on 60,000 more troops in Afghanistan. He had grave reservations. He did not share them with the president or with the people in the Situation Room. And the reason is, by the time the big surge decision was being debated in the fall of 2009, he knew that the president didn't like him. And he felt isolated. And his only real supporter was Hillary Clinton. And she was all for the surge. And he could not afford to have daylight between him and Hillary Clinton in the Situation Room. So those views stayed within a very small circle and didn't get expressed at that table. But they led him to push hard for negotiations with the Taliban. As he wrote in his diary, we cannot win this by military means. That's something that the military didn't think at that time. 
David Petraeus thought he could win this war, or at least pound the Taliban into submission so that they would be begging for talks. Holbrook's view, and it came from Vietnam, was you don't talk um, when you're beginning to withdraw troops, which is when Obama, Obama had promised that the surge troops would begin to leave in July 2011. Holbrook's believed you talk when you're at your maximum strength. Um, and he thought we should talk then, and we didn't. He could not get the White House, the military, the CIA, and to some extent his own boss, Hillary Clinton, behind it adequately to really push for negotiations at, before his death, which happened. He literally had his heart attack while talking to Hillary Clinton in her office about talks with the Taliban. So uh, That's, That, to me, is a tragedy. Yeah. I mean, I, what I couldn't quite discern was whether, you know, where you came down on this question of sort of U.S. power and agency in the world, you know, whether you're ultimately, yeah. you know, more of a whole Brookian in that, you know, seeing the limitations, but also this kind of where there's a will, there's a way positivism that I think is, you know, something he instilled in, you know, all the people who work for him and sort of the people who love him sort of love him for precisely that spirit, you know, or the kind right. of Obama, cool, you know, let's be realistic, uh, the world as it is, yes. sort of in uh, the title paradigm. of Ben Rhodes' book. Yeah, the title of Ben Rhodes' book. Right. Um, I don't see this book as having a foreign policy. That's a different book. This book is a story, and there really isn't room in it for my worked out views, which probably aren't worked out well enough to bear writing in a book. I, I was focused entirely on capturing this man. If you ask where are my sympathies, which are not exactly policy views, they're more like my instincts, but I think almost everybody's policy views basically come down to some core yeah. thing in their character that is practically pre-verbal. I'm, I'm a Holbrook sympathizer. I think when you watch him in action on the Balkans and you hear the arguments of so many people during that war saying we should, um, we have no interest here, why are we doing this? Um, you realize he was right. He was right. He, but it took someone like him to get it done. He was not a wild-eyed interventionist as maybe some critics from the right and the left would caricature him. He was skeptical. Vietnam made him a skeptic, but not of American leadership. He was a skeptic maybe of a almost entirely military view of American leadership. And I'm sympathetic to that. All right, I have, I'll ask one last question, then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. So please uh, start thinking about your <coughs> questions and you'll be able to answer them, ask them rather from your seats. Um, people will come around with mics in a moment. Uh, you know, in terms of his unfulfilled ambition, which is kind of a, a, a theme throughout the book, he wants to be Secretary of State, he comes close to grasping the brass ring a few times, but always misses. Uh, when, when his memorial service, which you describe, uh, took place at the Kennedy Center with this packed house and two presidents on stage and, you know, a phalanx of media and uh, drama and a kind of theatricality, uh, and, and the place to be seen. And then just a couple of months later, Warren Christopher dies, and it's you know a few hundred people in Los Angeles with maybe a couple of former Secretary of State, of State no former presidents, uh, you know, and some of Christopher's law partners. Now, Holbrook was felled in his prime, and, and Christopher lived a longer life, so that's, that's part of it. But really, it was sort of the, the, the velocity of the two men uh, was reflected, I think, in those two events and, and, and the way that they were mourned and remembered. And I, I felt at the time that Holbrook, you know, that that event was a reflection of his having gotten so much of what he wanted, uh, sort of de facto, if not de jure, in terms of his influence and stature and respect and the way he would be remembered. And I think, you know, your book is in some ways a reflection of that. Do you do you agree with that, or do you think the unrequited sort of drama of the position never attained is sort of the 
the mm. ultimate story here. Well, as you say, he died in action. I mean, he died not just on the job, but in full throttle on the job. So it was, it was dramatic. And the last pages of the book, I think, capture that drama. And you might think that Holbrook would have had it no other way. And maybe he certainly didn't want to die that young, but he would not right. have wanted to Go fade into and fade into yeah. a dotage <laughs> where he's you know, half blind and burbling and uh, needs to be taken care of. Holbrook was absolutely, I mean, in the last minutes of his life, According right. to all the people Dictating I talked to, memos and, yeah. he, he was in command of the room. Um, why were the people at the Kennedy Center? I was not there because we were about to have our second child here in New York, and I didn't want to miss that. Um, but I think a lot of them were there, as you say, out of a recognition that this was someone who had attempted much, achieved much, and perhaps failed at some too, but just attempt, achievement, failure, these are big things. These are the, kind of the ingredients of what Americans would like to think we're about. Warren Christopher did not embody Americanness. He embodied legal decorum. Richard Holbrook embodied all the strengths, the idealism, the energy, the excess, the overconfidence, um, the delivering of blows and bruises as well as the delivering of life that we sort of think of ourselves as being about. And maybe there was a sense in that room and among those people that we, would, we were not going to see this again because something was changing. It was changing subtly during the Obama years. It has changed dramatically since those years, and I really only knew what this book was about on election night 2016, when I, I realized that something new and diminished was now going to take over, and that what I was writing was no longer a contemporary story, it was history. Okay, um, so Rachel is gonna Tell me who we're going to call on. And I'm going to ask you to uh, keep it to a question. I'd like to try to get to as many of you as we can. Pose your question for George. Uh, hi. Uh, my apologies for not reading the book yet, but I'm not a speed reader. Uh, I'd just like to ask you, your description of Richard Holbrook is somebody that was very much in the moment, very much involved in events that were happening right then in his life. I'd like to know, was he also a long-term strategic thinker? Did he think in terms of where would this country be in 10, 20, 50 years? And if I'm not adding too much to the question, yeah. I'm particularly interested in the question of how he saw the role of China going into the 21st century. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, he was a lover of history, and so he never tired of looking back. He was obsessed with World War I. He was obsessed with the Versailles Peace Agreement. He was um, someone who never stopped believing that everything happening today is the product of things that have happened before we were born. I don't think he had the grand chess master geopolitical vision of Henry Kissinger. Um, he wasn't, I think he wasn't cold enough and he wasn't detached enough to see countries and peoples as moving parts that he could help marshal in some arrangement that would lead to the restoration of a balance of power or of uh, American influence or whatever. He was um, strategic in the sense that he understood the value of democracy, of the Atlantic Alliance, um, of America standing for something beyond its own very narrow self-interest. Those are strategic things, but they're also values. But I don't think he was, he couldn't have written a book that laid out the future 
and how exactly China and the United States were going to evolve over the next 25 or 50 years. I just don't think he had the patience for that. He was not particularly interested in Russia throughout the Cold War. That was not a subject that he was drawn to. The big uh, world standoff, that, it was just, that was too abstract for him. He was interested in human beings. He was far more drawn to a flood in Pakistan or a refugee crisis in Southeast Asia. But there's a certain adrenaline-driven... Or the accepted. slaughter of the residents of Sarajevo during the war. Those were the things, I think, that really captured both his interests and his talents. Next question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Um, I wonder if you could take us back to the opening weeks of 1993, right after Clinton's election. You now had the return to power. People have been in the desert for 12 years. Mm. They were spooked by the reputation of Jimmy Carter for being too pacific, uh, and they were determined to show a robust and muscular kind of American role in the world, but liberal values uh, as their goal. Um, and one of the first things that uh, was done after he became Assistant Secretary for European Affairs was the torpedoing of the Vance Owen plan for a resolution in Bosnia based on ethnic cantonments that within two years, in effect repackaged, became Dick Holbrook's plan at Dayton. Um, but in so doing, he managed to uh, make the Europeans feel that they were helpless, that they had to be led by the United States, something that was only shattered by the uh, Iraq adventure. Could yeah. you tell us a bit about um, how that represented the moment of American leadership uh, recast for that post-Cold War period? Well, supposedly that was the hour of Europe, in the words of uh, a diplomat from Luxembourg. It is not the hour of America. In other words, we'll take care of this. Um, and Bill Clinton was happy for it to be the hour of Europe. He didn't really want to have very much to do with Bosnia. He had campaigned on an interventionist critique, an attack on George H.W. Bush for allowing this slaughter to go on. But as soon as he was in office, he looked at all the options and thought, there's nothing good here. This is not going to help me. We're certainly not going to send troops because the public would never stand for it. Certainly Vietnam was hanging over him, but so was Somalia, which by October had become a disaster with the Black Hawk Down incident in Mogadishu. So, and Bill Clinton was focused, as we know, on like a laser beam on the economy. Holbrook was trying throughout those months to get the administration. Um, he didn't really have much faith in Vance Owen because he just didn't think that the Serbs were ready to stop fighting. And I think he was right about that. He wanted us to start bombing the bridges over the Drina River um, and to give aid, give weapons to the Bosnian army, train them, and then see if they could defend themselves. That was a non-starter, both with the European allies, who had UN troops in Bosnia, and with the Clinton higher-ups. And Holbrook didn't have a position to do anything. He couldn't get a job for months, mainly because the people around Bill Clinton didn't like him and didn't want him to have a job. When he finally got the, a job, it was ambassador to Germany. It had very little to do with Bosnia. But then they came to him. The title of that chapter is, They'll Come For Me. Every, title, every chapter title is a quote. And that one is Holbrook. In one of, the, one of his real finest hours, he was a civilian. He was a banker. And he still spent New Year's Eve 1992 in Sarajevo. Managed to get into this besieged city where there was no heat and very little food and a lot of shooting, and came back to Washington just seized with the idea that we had to intervene. And that never left him. It took two and a half years for the Clinton administration to catch up with Holbrook. Um, and so that's not exactly an example of, of decisive American leadership. It's, a, it's actually a pretty poor example of American indecision and lack of resolve. But Holbrook was the one guy who was consistently saying this matters, it matters to Europe, it matters to us, it matters for humane reasons, we need to be there. And finally, uh, much too late, the war ended because of his work at Dayton. We have an online question, although uh, this, this, this might be a softball for George. 
Would Holbrook have had a shot at Secretary of State had he lived, or were too many bridges already burned? So it would have had to be in 2016, uh, which <laughs> Didn't, might have been have gone the way. biggest heartbreak of yeah. all for Richard Holbrook. Yeah. Would Hillary Clinton have named him? By 2016, I have my doubts, because he would have been 75 years old by that time. Um, and who knows what, we can't speculate. Right. What, I'm, not even, I'm not even certain he would have been her pick in 2008. Some of her aides tell me maybe not as likely as some people think. But that was his best chance, 2008. And when that one eluded him after 96, 2000, 2004, coming very close every time, um, I saw him actually in, at Denver, the Democratic Convention, and he was very detached from everything. Sort of the way he was when he went to Sarajevo, um, because yeah, he, had, he, was, yeah. he was locked out. He was on the outside. Please? Um, I, I'd like to know what you think of the uh, theory that is out there, and I don't think it was in your book, that a Holbrook style of diplomacy, kind of bulldozer style, worked well in the Balkans with people like Milosevic, but did not work well in South Asia, where he offended Karzai, he offended the Pakistani leadership, as you do write about. Yeah, I've heard that many times. I heard it from many Afghan leaders in Kabul, who, for them, that's an article of faith. Holbrook thought we were like Milosevic. He was wrong. I think there's some truth to it. He um, certainly didn't hide the fact that he wanted to get rid of Hamid Karzai. And when Karzai figured that out, very quickly. Uh, he said, you're not going to get rid of me. And when Karzai won that duel, uh, Holbrook was in persona non grata in Kabul for the rest of his life. And it really damaged him. But it's not totally true. Because if you look at what he did in the Balkans, he didn't just hammer people. He persuaded people. Persuasion was his real gift as a diplomat, not brute force. For example, President Izabegovic of Bosnia was not someone you could hammer. He was sort of reticent, aloof, reluctant, skeptical. Holbrook just spent hours talking to him and going to Sarajevo again and again and again, meeting him in Ankara, meeting him in Geneva. A bit the same with Tujman. He didn't pound on Tujman. That wouldn't have worked. He pounded on Milosevic a bit, but it's exaggerated. They had these endless night-long conversations over heaps of lamb and rice and bottle after bottle of Slivovitz and wine, which Holbrook would pretend to drink but didn't so that he could win the argument. And um, he, he outsmarted Milosevic. He cornered him. And th these are not the tactics just of a bully. So I, I think it's a bit overdrawn, but it is true that at the end of his life, he had lost some of that knack for reading the other that, he, that was such a crucial skill for a diplomat and maybe thought he was going to get his way a little too quickly and too easily. We have time, I'm told, for one more question. There is one. Someone's up there. Go ahead. It's hard for me to see. I can't see things. Yeah. Hello. Um, so I know that Richard Holbrook was Peace Corps Director of Morocco. Yes. Um, as a former volunteer myself, I'm in, from Morocco. Uh, I volunteered in Morocco as well. I'm curious about how the idealism of the Peace Corps interacts with his kind of um, more uh, <laughs> interventionalist view of foreign policy and promoting American power, how that interplays with Peace Corps' focus on you know, world peace and friendship. I, think it, just, I want to build yeah. on that, because I think it's actually a very important question and it timely. Is. Because at least what I hear in your question is about sort of how idealism, and particularly idealism of a rising generation, uh, you know, which might be inspired by the chance to work in Morocco for the Peace Corps, but has, you know, now sort of taken on this grave skepticism and hostility it's toward true. the use of American power and particularly intervention. And I, th I yeah. think those two things 
uh, were intertwined and intersected in somebody like Holbrook, and they've become bifurcated today. And I, I'm, I'm also curious yeah. what you make of that. I was also a Peace Corps volunteer in, in Togo, and, and I share your attachment to its spirit. I mean, Holbrook had a great time in Morocco. Uh, he wasn't there for very long. It was sort of a holding pattern for him. Uh, Nixon was president. Holbrook told Henry Kissinger, I'm not going to work for Richard Nixon. He stayed out of Washington for, or at least stayed out of the, the State Department throughout those years of Republican rule until Jimmy Carter came in. So it was a, he loved the job, but it was not uh, a formative experience for him. I think the main thing it gave him was the experience of running something. He bit, was an idealist, a, though. So I'm getting to that. He was, he was a, someone who really saw, I think, other people and did not imagine that everyone was either like us or wanted to be governed by us or to be told what values to have by us. He had a, a real sense that people are autonomous. They want to be free. They want to make their own decisions. His own agency, I think, led him to see the agency of others. And Vietnam was where that began, where whatever we did, the Vietnamese seemed to say, no, we don't want that. Um, how does it fit with interventionism? Well, I think Holbrook, as I've said, was not a militarist. He did not see the US military using force as the answer to problems. In Bosnia, he saw force and diplomacy in alignment as the answer. Without force, the diplomacy had failed and would have continued to fail. Without diplomacy, the force would have just created a desert. Um, so I say at the beginning that he had these two really driving qualities, idealism and egotism. Idealism without egotism is feckless. And a country that thinks that it's going to have a foreign policy entirely based on human rights and self-determination and generosity and selflessness and altruism is not a country. That's an NGO. <laughs> but a country entirely based on selfish interest and us alone and transactionalism is called Trump's America. And in between those two, there is a marriage of the, those two forces in Holbrook, the selfish and the idealistic. And they needed each other because without Idealism, egotism is destructive, and American power is destructive without idealism. And I think at his best, he, he brought those into harmony, uh, and we see that in, in almost every one of his achievements. And that's why at the beginning of the book I say I, I miss that era. As, as full of folly as, as it was, as wrong as Vietnam was, as wrong as so many things were, I miss it. Because the alternative is not America the NGO. The alternative is Trump's America. George, yeah. Uh, so just in closing, I think you know, one of the, and you, you, you pull this out, um, but for me it's one of the most salient things about him, is, was the loyalty that he attracted in people. Not in everybody. He had you know, many detractors, as you talk about, but I, I'll never forget the night that he passed away, uh, a, a line of cars, people almost like falling into formation, parking outside, the hospital at GW when each of us had heard what had happened. Yeah. Everybody just you know, jumped in their car and was there. And I almost thought to myself, like, who else would I have done that? You know, I've had great bosses. I've been very lucky, but it's yeah. hard to imagine. And you know, can I, I think Can you I were, interrupt for a second? Yes. Tomorrow night, I'm going to be speaking in Washington. And after the event, there's going to be a gathering at the house of one of his top aides, Dan Feldman, of all the people who worked for him at the end of his right, life. Right, it was 10, it was, you know, it's almost 10 years yeah, ago now. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're so right. And there's, there are people in this audience who worked with him almost 20 years ago at the US mission to the UN, and some of them are out there uh, waving. Yes. So that unbelievable loyalty that he did inspire, and that I think is motivated by what motivated you ultimately to tell the story. And I'm curious, 
as a journalist, balancing that sense of personal loyalty and fealty to what he represented that you described so eloquently, but also being true to your role as a journalist? I mean, the emotional force behind a project like this, which is not an easy thing to, to do, to finish, has to be some, um, yeah, some strong feeling for the subject. It cannot be neutral. It cannot be detached. That's why I created, I invented a narrator who could be that voice. Um, but at the same time, my highest loyalty has to be to the truth. Otherwise, I'm betraying my readers. So there's maybe a bit of a divided loyalty. And maybe Richard Holbrook would not have liked everything that I wrote in this book about him. Um, that I can't help because my, my loyalty really first has to be to the truth. I would say it's not so much that I feel loyal to him. I just feel drawn to him. I can't stop thinking about him. I can't stop wanting to hear more stories about him. I just heard one today that I say, damn it, I wish I'd heard that when I was still working on the book. <laughs> um, and I can't stop hearing his voice in my head as, as the book opens with and closes with. And that's, it, maybe that's a form of loyalty, but it feels more primal than loyalty. It, no, it, primal is a good word yeah. to describe. So, well, if you haven't gotten your copy of Our Man, mm -hmm. they're for sale right outside, and George is going to... As of today, there. As of today, yeah. uh, for the first time, you can get your hands on this. And uh, having heard what you've heard, I know you know that if you haven't read it yet, if you weren't one of the lucky ones with with a galley, uh, that you've got to read this book. Uh, it's Thank just a, a incredibly beautiful, rich, riveting, and singular account of a, a, a beautiful, rich, riveting, and singular person. So thank you so much, Thanks, George. Thanks, Suzanne. That was nice. Yeah. Thank you.